Oh, welcome back to Sunday Science, everybody. It was a nice little vacation that I had to take there. I needed to break away, otherwise I was going to lose my mind. So apologies for not having a show for a couple of weeks, but we are back, and this is going to be a great year for science. <coughs> so with some of the cantankerous things that both SciStrike and myself have been doing, I thought it might be a lot of fun to talk about not quite 100-year-old tech that has advanced our knowledge and our understanding in the world of physics, in the world of electronics, in the world of computing science to such an extent that, well, we get to sit down and have the internet and do things like this. <laughs> and one of those most awesome things that has really been a driving force is particle accelerators. And it might not seem like it, but there is a tremendous amount of technology that we yield today due to particle accelerator technology coming into existence. And like I say, this is it's it has yet to be a century since this work really started taking off. And it's a absolute amazement the amount of information that we have learned from something as simple as making something go real fast. <laughs> Obviously, there are lots of things in history that we have made go real fast that all we learned was we need better brakes on this car or <laughs> let's start NASCAR because there will be booze a-flowing. <laughs> <laughs> but, anywho, back to the particle accelerators. So, this, obviously, I'm not a particle physicist. This is not, this is a, this is a hobby of mine. This is not an area where I am an expert in any way, shape, or form. There's a very good chance that I may make mistakes in this field, but I find particle physics so exciting and so fun it's it's just a wonderful sector of science and so much information has been learned in such a small amount of time it's the 20th and moving into the 21st century has just well it's accelerated our science so much i see what you did there <laughs> ah you know i like wordplay <laughs> <clears throat> Oh hey, do you need the? Uh, do you have the? Uh, do you want the pop out chat? Or are you just? You go oh yeah, I should probably get I'll that from you. I'll, I'll put it in the. Uh, I'll put it in the thing. There. That always does help. <laughs> One of these days, I swear I will learn how to use a computer and find that on my own. <laughs> it's not a, not a big deal. I do not. I do not mind copy and paste. And really, I should have done it before uh, you got started. I kind of left you hanging there. Here we go. Yeah, it happens. That should do the trick for you. All right. Okay, and I do apologize, everyone. I'm, I had some uh, family come into town and wanted to let them have some peace and quiet in the basement. So I'm outside with the dogs. So you will hear them barking. And you might hear me yell at them if I forget to mute in time. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too bad, though. <laughs> you, you, you did you did conclude and extinguish all experiments that were in the basement that involved fire before leaving them on a right yes i i <laughs> okay. i had to move a couple of experiments outside the well the tesla coil that i'm working on i had to restart because i was an idiot and made it not only did i make a calculation error i also made a material selection error so that one's not to worry about my jacob's ladder is now well i'm building a building a nice little case for it so that it can be on display and get the transformer out of any indirect accidental contact from anything so plus they kind of spoil the visual effect of you of the uh of the experiment slash demonstration it's good it's good to hide the transformers well yeah you know you don't you don't want that openly available for people to just see you just want two copper wires with little bunny ears at the top and 
big electric arcs. Indeed. Oh, that, that, <laughs> you got to remind me. Uh, <coughs> I, I, I came by an extra uh, TV flyback transformer. Little tiny thing puts out a fine amount of voltage, anywhere from 30 to 40K. Nice. Got to talk after. You need this. <laughs> I'm not using it. You need it. <laughs> so. Very awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Carry on. No worries. Well, I mean, speaking of high voltages, this is, that's basically exactly where accelerator technology started from was obviously there was math theory involved and a whole lot of other things that don't necessarily need to get into, but generating extremely high voltages was the beginning of particle accelerators. So it was back in the late 1920s, early 1930s, there was a, <clears throat> sorry, my dog's going insane. I might have to put her inside. She wants to hear about accelerators. <laughs> she wants to bark at people on the bike path. Oh, all right. That's good too. Eh, you know, it's good exercise. <laughs> uh, anywho, so back in the late twenties, early thirties, there were, uh, two different, in well, two individuals at the Cavendish laboratory in Cambridge, uh, Cockroft and Walton. I might be pronouncing his name wrong. I'm not sure. And there was also Van de Graaff, which I'm sure a lot of people are already familiar with the name from certain fun toy like experiments that you can make. Anywho, <clears throat> the, uh, the Walton generator at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, it pretty interesting looking contraption. It almost looks like tens of, just tens upon tens of Tesla coils stacked on top of each other. And basically, the way that it was generating extremely high voltage, around 800 kilovolts was the the circuit that they built is called the voltage multiplier cascade and it was the effectively it was the very first particle accelerator that ever actually produced any sort of uh disintegration so they fired a proton using this 800 kilovolt generator they fired a proton into a lithium target and were able to actually generate the very first uh, nuclear disintegration. And this <clears throat> not only led to a uh, Nobel Prize in physics, but they were also, it's still technology that's used this day and age even for initial stages of colliders that we're going to get to shortly. The other one that was going on was the Van de Graaff accelerator. And Van de Graaff's accelerator is based on a Van de Graaff generator, and it... I, I'm not entirely sure how in the world it actually winds up accelerating a proton, but I know there's someone on here with us right now that happens to have built a Van de Graaff generator. So, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about how that functions and how you were able to go about building it, Sai. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a really simple device. Um, it, I th we, we talked briefly about it quite a, quite a while ago. I think we showed a video. Maybe I'll pull it up after. But um, essentially, it's a, it's a, it's a non-conductive uh, belt <clears throat> a graph generator runs with. Um, uh, between the base and and the uh, the top collector, and there are um, metal combs at the bottom of the top, and the charge differential that that ends up being on the belt comes from uh, oddly enough in in a in a self excited Van de Graaff generator comes from the separation of the non conductive belt from the material that the roller that it's that it's uh, you know, rolling on the pulley uh, is made of, and it's separated in parts. A, a, uh, a 
charge on the inside, which of course causes an opposing charge on the other side, uh, which then zips up the tube and is collected by the, uh, the comb at the top. That's it, self-excited. Um, kind of enhance it a little bit by intentionally laying down a charge on the belt at the base high voltage transformer. And they're incredible. That, that, that's it. That what I've just said is the entire theory of operation, uh, lay in, in layman's terms, of <laughs> a Van de Graaff generator. That's <clears throat> to understand what it's doing. That's all you have to know. The effect that generates a charge is called the trivioelectric effect. And it's when you, uh, it, that's the separating of, of, uh, of two dissimilar materials. Um, uh, stri one strips electrons off of the other. And that's, that's basically it. And, uh, it's a very awesome. I'm good. I'm definitely going to have to try building one of those someday because it just looks like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, and, and you can construct it with, I don't know if I showed you the, the original Anybody Can Build It one, and I got all nuts and built the big Oh, yeah, I, and, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, and, uh, well, you saw, you see, you're supposed to say no so I can run a video. Uh, heck. Okay. Oh, you're right. I've never seen that before, so I, please show us. <laughs> oh, you sound like Hillel. Well done. All right. Here's the I was doing my best Hillel impression. That was a darn good Hillel. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, here, here's the little fella. You can see it's, um, this was constructed so anybody could make it at home. The top sphere is a light bulb, a tin foil already. And, uh, it's been functioning. It's, uh, you can see the, the, uh, tissue at the top. Of course, never, if there's anything dangerous, you definitely want to poke it. <laughs> Important safety tip. <laughs> but, um, anyway, the, uh, the uh, tissue strips at the top, um, uh, the, the collected charge on the on the sphere at the top, uh, deposited on the uh, the tissue paper strips, and as you know, like charges are not very fond of each other, so that's why they kind of raise. Anyway, indeed, that's uh, <laughs> that's the first thing anybody can build it, and uh, oh, maybe I should make a little. Yeah, at some point I'll make a little video. Hey, how to make a Van Graaff generator of your very own? Yep, that's that. There awesome. You go. <laughs> so, well, the uh, well, the Walton accelerator was able to generate upwards of 800 kilovolts with the simplicity and ease of a Van de Graaff generator. Van de Graaff was actually able to produce 0.6 mega electron volts with his accelerator. Uh, I'm not sure what that was. Hello. Whoops, sorry, but I was distracted by oh. the public chat. Uh, my, my apologies. Was there a question there? No, my my laptop did a weird little doot de loo and it made me think I somehow got dropped from the chat no, or no. from the hangout. Nope, you're there. I was just... Oh, okay. Uh, let me get back to... Uh, Fino asked a little while back, why, do, why, 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 is it, why is it Jacob's Ladder called a Jacob's Ladder? What the hell does it have to do with that <laughs> and, uh, and i don't know the answer <laughs> i have absolutely no idea why a jacob's ladder is called that indeed i just know that they're a lot of fun and if you're doing it with a microwave transformer like i did they're incredibly dangerous keep your hands very far away hmm. it, that's way too much current coming out of a microwave transformer if you're using neon sign transformer it, you're dealing with significantly less current and significantly higher voltages. I still wouldn't go anywhere near the darn thing, but if you do choose to make one out of a microwave transformer, just realize if you touch that arc or if you touch those wires, you will be sleeping with the fishes long before your body hits the ground. They're extraordinarily dangerous. <laughs> I would ah. agree. Anywho, so 0.6 mega electron volts is an extremely high amount of energy. And it can accelerate a hydrogen ion. Well, 
yeah, this, this is part of the area where I'm not a physicist, so I'm just going to kind of leave that one open. If you're interested, I suggest going and checking out some other channels about physics, maybe Fermilab or something to that effect, because they're going to be a much better a much better educational resource for what this ridiculously high energy levels actually are and how to describe them. Oh, you know what? I said, again, sorry to interrupt. That was you're fine. We should maybe we should mention what an electron volt actually is. Just so that if someone is unfamiliar, they're they're not uh, you know they're not thinking that it's just it's just a level of voltage like you're measuring with a voltmeter. Um, an electron volt is um, and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> an electron volt is the amount of energy needed to move one electron one centimeter. Is that correct, or am I leaving something out? No, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. That's the one, to my understanding. So it's it's a measure. It has the word volt in it, but it's not just a voltage measurement. It's uh, it's, it's it's the amount of energy that that's uh, the unit of measure, and uh, yeah. the, the the levels Andy was just discussing are significantly higher than one electron volt. So there you go. Oh yeah, six hundred thousand electron volts is a uh, that's a tremendous amount of energy. Hmm. Uh, so. Moving on from uh, Van der Graaff, we finally started moving into the era of the very first linear accelerator, which is the LIMAC. And that was developed, actually, all, all, a lot of these things all started coming together at the same time. The, the late 20s, early 30s, even though there was some weird things happening politically around the globe, it was an absolutely amazing era for physics. Uh, God, my dog's annoying sometimes. <laughs> Anywho, so absolutely amazing era for physics. Obviously, if you're a fan of physics and you look into any of this, there was so much happening in the late 20s, early 30s. We barely even knew at the beginning of the 20th century that atoms were atoms. And... By the 30s, we were learning how to accelerate a hydrogen ion, which is it's just a hydrogen atom stripped of its electron. And we were smashing it into lithium. And it's amazing. It, it's just, it's really amazing how quickly all of this progressed. And the, well, the first linear accelerator, it was, uh, ran on AC voltage as opposed to uh, earlier things that were running on direct current. And what it, the way that it worked, from what I understand, is it used a series of uh, peaks and anti-peaks of voltage in order to charge a particle and actually accelerate it to these ridiculously high speeds. Uh, again, I am just an enthusiast. I'm not a physicist, so I could be wrong in this, and I definitely don't understand the math at that level. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I wish I did, but I don't. And linear accelerators are actually pretty darn cool because they're they're still in use today, and it's still one of the first stages that. Well, obviously, eventually we are going to get to the LHC, and one of the very first stages is a linear accelerator. And I believe the uh, Stanford linear accelerator is actually the largest on the planet. I can't remember exactly what it's capable of producing as far as power, but I I want to say it's somewhere around 50 million electron volts. So you're dealing with energy levels that are, I mean, they're mind-blowing. It's, it's hard to even fathom that amount of energy being produced. And it's all from this push a particle through a little piece and then a little piece and then a little piece. And with the right oscillation, you're able to accelerate a single proton to near the speed of light. It's I, I threw up a absolutely. Picture. I, I threw a picture up there so folks could follow what, what you were saying. Awesome. Yeah. I just have the live chat window open. Normally I'm on my PC, so I have both windows, but 
Oh, okay. Like I say, uh, Colorado is going through a very unusually hot winter for the third year in a row. And sorry for everyone on the East Coast. It's like 65 degrees here. I'm sorry you guys are all freezing. I wouldn't mind having our snow back, though. I'm getting tired of this. <laughs> yeah, you do. You know, I don't mind the snow. You can. Have, you want the cold? We, uh, we'll get that to you right away. <laughs> but, yeah, you, if you, you can't see because you're on a, uh, you're not on the computer. It's it's base. It is a linear accelerator. It shows the. Um, uh, basically, it's it's the simplest form, just like you described, with that ion source and a bunch of conductors, which are basically tubes in the earliest versions. Each one. Uh, longer than the one before it, so that with a single frequency, it's accelerated as it passes through each longer tube as it as it changes polarity. So that's the picture that's up there now. For but it's, it's a graphical representation of what Andy was just talking about. Excellent. I'm glad everyone can see what I'm talking about because so, I I know it's sometimes without imagery, it's a little tricky to grasp. And that's sometimes you know it. Yeah, pictures help. <laughs> We are a visually stimulated species. Uh, so after, well, and again, all of this, again, all around the exact same time. So uh, right ag again, right before 1930, there was also the, uh, <clears throat> inspired by actually the work of the linear accelerator, the uh, first cyclotron was developed. Now, I'm not entirely sure when the first cyclotron was actually built, but it was a huge step forward in accelerating particles to near light speed so that we could make the most awesome explosions in the world that are tiny. Just because something explodes doesn't mean it needs to be gigantic. It can be really, really small and learn a lot more from it. <laughs> Uh, the cyclotron, I'm, I'm still learning how it is that cyclotrons actually function. They're, they're tricky. I, I'm, I'm going to say that. Like I say, I'm not a physicist, so I'm learning as well as just talking about this stuff. But the basic diagram of a cyclotron is uh, starts kind of in a D-shape spiral of accelerating a particle around a curve with the magnetic field. And <clears throat> by doing this, you are actually able to accelerate, uh, let's see, it was, it looks like it was in 1931, able to accelerate a hydrogen ion to 80 kilo electron volts. So, <laughs> it's, it's, sometimes I'm surprised that our that science has progressed to this so rapidly because these energy levels, you would really think somebody would have messed up and somebody would have gotten hurt and someone would have said, maybe we shouldn't do this. But in the name of science, you always press on. <laughs> Indeed. I threw up a diagram of the cyclotron to go with this and it shows again, what you just described where there's the alternate, the uh, half circles. And whereas in the, uh, linear accelerator then he was talking about last it changes the uh the polarity of each longer tube uh these in the simplest explanation it uh changes the charge on each half of this circle um and the, the containment is by magnetic above and below that keeps everything anyway um and that excel instead of uh accelerating in a straight line encourages it to spin in uh, at, at higher velocities, and then the emitted uh, here, as you can see in the picture in the top. So there you go, cyclotron. Indeed, thanks for thanks for keeping up with the graphics. I I was having a really hard time finding anything that wasn't just a a textbook paper about some of this history. So uh, I really uh, appreciate your. Your end of the work here in finding all the graphical representations of what I'm talking about, because not a, not a problem. And I'm having the same trouble that that, uh, that that you had is finding actual pictures of the actual historical devices 
uh, that we're ta that we're specifically looking for. I mean, there's a lot of pictures of, of uh, cyclotrons, synchrotrons, uh, linear accelerators, and all that, but not 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 the origins. I'm having trouble. So, same as you described, finding good images of these uh, original devices. So it's, it's basically they are hard to find. I mean, most of them are going to be scanned pictures or slides. You know, it's it's just hard to find. Indeed. Uh, anywho, so from the cyclotron, uh, inevitably, again, right around the exact same time, right before 1930, I don't know what was going on in the late 1920s, but I kind of wish I could go back in time just to watch it because it sounds like an amazing, an amazing time to have been around, you know, aside from weird political stuff happening. It was a, it seems like a really great decade for physics. <laughs> uh, one of the other ones produced again right around the same time, or at least theorized around the same time. I don't believe it was built until uh, much later, but uh, in the late 20s, there was also the uh, Betatron that was theorized could come into existence and actually be produced, but of course the manufacturing technology wasn't available yet, so it took a while, and I think it was, I think there might have actually been a little bit of Manhattan Project help in producing it. And the Betatron actually, <clears throat> its initial development it was actually for uh, medical devices, so significantly better x-ray machines and things of that nature as opposed to a particle accelerator, but its technology also wound up leading into things that were capable of assisting in particle accelerators coming into existence. Uh, I, I really don't know anything about the Betatron other than that, but it is part of the history, so got to mention it. <laughs> and once again, here's a picture. <laughs> not, not a photo, Andy, it's not a photograph. Again, it's a, it's a, a design, basically a, a design of how it works. Um, the, um, um, essentially the, the, uh, uh, the particles are kept moving in a uh, circular path and accelerated until, uh, they reach a sufficient speed. Whack a target and results in uh, the emission of x rays and electrons and all sorts of fun stuff. So, there's another picture for you. Back to you, Andy. <laughs> Very awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're able to keep up with the pictures because the, the technology all developed so fast and it was just not in the digital age where we could pull out an iPhone and take a picture of something that. <laughs> But I'm really glad that these people did the work that they did. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to pull out an iPhone or have a laptop or internet or, you know, go to the moon. So just because you're not able to take a picture of it at the time doesn't mean that the technology you're creating is not eventually going to come into existence. And I'm sure... I'm sure a lot of physicists have loved being able to see the theories they've constructed and actually being able to finally be carried out in tests. I can't imagine what it was like to sit down and win the Nobel prize for the Higgs particle, well, Higgs field so many years after having theorized it. It's, I was actually just watching a Nova special about it and on, the, all three of those physicists looked like they were going to cry. It was, that had to have been such a monumentous occasion for them. It's awesome. And it's thanks to this kind of technology that they were able to get there. So after the, after the cyclotron, uh, I, I, I know it was built somewhere around World War II, and I, I swear I think there was some... Manhattan Project science involved in it. I'm not 100% sure. I could be wrong, but moving forward from that, there was the Microtron. And obviously, as we get faster and we get better and we're able to generate more 
energy, we're able to utilize that energy in better fashions. And with the Microtron, we were able to, you know, people were able to start actually generating energy levels upwards of, <laughs> it's just insane to think about. And it's insane to think that it's nowhere near what we're producing now, but 25 mega electron volts. And this is, I mean, you, you are actually approaching the speed of light at this point in time. You're, you're moving something with so much energy and such energies that you are approaching the speed of light and certain equations, you know, by certain individuals are actually starting to really take shape and look like they might have a lot more of a foothold than just theory. In case you're wondering, yes, I did put a Microtron diagram up. Awesome. I figured you would. <laughs> <laughs> eh, I'm funny like that. Oh, and then from there we move into it, it, things just start sounding weird at a certain point in time. You, you add too many machines together and you have to, you have to incorporate the name of every single one of those machines and somehow you get to the synchrocyclotron. Ah, uh, that's a tongue twister for days. So the synchrocyclotron is a modified version of the classic cyclotron. And it, its primary purpose was, it was developed originally to overcome the relativistic limitations of the traditional cyclotron that had already been produced. Now, this is where we start stacking technology on top of technology because you go to, I, I've never actually been to CERN. I hope maybe someday I'll be able to, but obviously as a tourist only. This is where we actually, well, started stacking the technologies one on top of the other. And energy levels were just unbelievably high at this point. It was <sighs> unbelievable. I, 190 mega electron volts being produced. So <laughs> let's not just push a hydrogen ion anymore. Let's start pushing deuterium. It's <laughs> unbelievable. I'm, I'm sorry I'm sitting here giggling and chuckling and laughing about it, but these energy levels are so unbelievably high. I'm really surprised that there was never a cataclysmic event that made a laboratory disappear. <laughs> I'm not suggesting artificial black hole or anything, but that is so much energy in one small little packet. It's unbelievable. And moving forward from that, we get to the synchrotron, which I think there might actually still be a synchrotron in I think there's one at Oak Ridge Labs. I could be, like I say, I'm not a physicist, just an enthusiast, but I think there might actually still be a synchrotron at Oak Ridge Labs. I'm not 100% sure, but again, effectively reaching almost the speed of light. Energy levels just unprecedented. <laughs> somewhere in the order of three giga electron volts, electron volts. So three trillion electron volts. These energy levels are absolutely unbelievable. And to know that, I mean, this is all taking place in the 1950s. So Thanks to this technology, unfortunately, yes, there are nuclear weapons. That's a that's kind of a bummer, but that's 
<laughs> it, it happens sometimes. And this may come as a surprise to you, Andy, but there is also a diagram of a synchrotron <laughs> on the screen at the moment. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're able to find these pictures because I was not having much luck at all. Well, not a uh, not not a problem. Yeah, cool thing about a synchrotron is uh, protons are pretty much cooking when, when they enter the system. <laughs> and once again, oh yeah, they're they're they're, they're, they're 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 already at extremely high energy levels from going through a linear accelerator to begin with. Indeed, and then they enter the same circular path you may be familiar with from the earlier. Uh, accelerator models that we've we've taken a brief look at. So uh, indeed, and it's it, it's really kind of cool the way that accelerator technology can just continuously be stacked one on top of the other because most a little, so much technology just simply doesn't work that way. If if I take a transformer and plug it into a transformer, I'll blow up the second transformer. It, it's not going to continuously increase voltage. It's just going to fry. But you can sit down with these technologies and the circuits that are involved with them are, I mean, I'll be real honest, they're beyond my understanding. But you can just somehow keep stacking and stacking and stacking all of these technologies on top of one another and eventually, that's actually what CERN, it's the entire accelerator complex is, it's not one particle accelerator. It's not like that, it's not like there's just some magic magnetically energized donut out there in Europe that somehow does this. It's, it's accelerator after accelerator after accelerator all charging these particles to, well, let's be real honest, some of the uh, most insane energy levels you could imagine, uh, pushing roughly seven tera electrovol electron volts. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's just insane. Big. <clears throat> that's, there's, I mean, well, obviously, there is a reason why the accelerator at CERN was able, and something that's, it's hard to think about with CERN. It's, it's not an accelerator. It is a series of accelerators. It's not a detector. It's a series of detectors. So this is, it's such a monumentous push for science, and yeah, I could, kind of wish uh, us here in America would spend a little bit more money on science and a little less on being jerks because at a whopping $10 billion, yeah, we could have built that thing overnight. We've and we more, should have. We've spent more on less. <laughs> yep. So the accelerator at CERN, it's, it's, it's wildly complex. Uh, Hopefully, Size Strike's going to be able to pull up a picture because you're dealing with a, oh my gosh, linear accelerator. Of, oh my God, there's so much happening. It's still have a synchrotron. You have a super proton synchrotron. You have the actual LHC. You have an isotope separator. It's the entire complex has got to be one of the coolest underground facilities I could ever imagine going to. And this, I'm sure a lot of people have seen pictures of the actual LH, the uh, CMS is the main detector that most people see. It's enormous. But there's also the Atlas, there's Alice, there, it's, the, the entire complex is just phenomenal. And the work that they've been able to do at CERN is, it's mind-blowing. And to, to finally have an actual understanding of why mass exists. You know, if, if particles didn't have mass, if that wasn't there, we wouldn't exist. And it's this 
weird, tiny little fundamental thing that to think our, our world wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. Everything would just be floating through the cosmos at the speed of light, essentially, if nothing had mass. So getting to this point in less than 100 years of we think there might be these things called atoms to holy crap we can smash a proton into a proton at almost the speed of light and from the decay product of that explosion we now know why there's mass it's unbelievable it's it doesn't seem like a lot happens in physics regularly. You know, there, there's a lot of discoveries in medicine regularly. There's a lot of discoveries in manufacturing technologies regularly. Physics seems like it moves really slow, but in the long haul, less than a hundred years, is there this thing called an atom to, here's the standard model, this is what matter is. This is why matter is. It is probably the fastest moving science. I mean, if if you could imagine, go back to, you know, 2500 BC and go to Egypt. And yes, there's medical science available that archaeologically we've been able to see, hey, you can... You can fuse broken bones. You can you can fix a person. You you have this amazing me medical advancements taking place. Not much has changed. I if I break my arm, I'm going to go to the doctor and almost an identical procedure as to forty five hundred years ago. But in the world of particle physics, in the world of accelerator technology in the era of accelerator technology. We have gone from there's an idea that might be to it's real. It's in front of us. It is testable. It is repeatable. It is absolutely amazing how, how fast the world of physics is moving right now. And while I normally push for an hour, that's kind of that's kind of about all I have for this particular episode. Actually, to then just babble about something because hold on, I'm, I'm I'm digging up something that'll make a nice wrap up. <laughs> ah, working on the pictures. So, yeah, babble. <laughs> all right, so continuing the babble, <laughs> and it it. Sometimes it's actually difficult to sit down and quantify how it is that we have we've moved so far so quickly. It's an absolutely wonderful day and age to exist. Our technology is advancing almost at a scary rate. Sometimes it is a little bit scary, but the science behind it and the, the technological advancements within the scientific community have, they've come so far, so fast. Sitting down and looking at something in a microscope in, well, let's say 1918, you could, it, it would be hard to fathom back then that in only a couple decades, someone would figure out how to make a scanning electron microscope. And they would be able to employ that in the field and utilize, well, not really in the field, but in the lab. And we can build it. We can push the boundaries of science so far at this point in time. I can understand why there are certain groups of individuals that don't think it's real because it you know, sucks to be them. They think that way, but we are advancing at such a rapid rate. Even, even the most basic of things, the phone in your camera, the camera in your phone, <laughs> phone on your camera, same thing at this point in time, I guess. You know, when the very first time that I ever saw a cell phone, there was, there was no way that you could put a phone into it or a camera into it. It, 
camera was all film based. Everything was still chemically driven and then it went digital. Now all of a sudden the cameras are getting smaller and they're smaller and they're smaller and we can accelerate them with projects like the New Horizon and we can shoot tiny cameras on these ultra lightweight craft faster than anything that's ever been man-made before through our solar system and in a matter of years get our first up-close pictures of Pluto. It... <sighs> okay, I'm ready. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> All right. At some point in time, I had to bring up New Horizons. <laughs> Not a problem. Anyway, um, I just wanted to throw in uh, a somewhat uh, not trivial point is uh, uh, is there any particle acceleration uh, in, in that was just uh, among the general public for distribution that anybody could have and own? And, well, oddly enough, <laughs> the answer to that <laughs> is yes. Andy, what I'm showing is a uh, triode, a diagram of a triode vacuum tube. For a long time. Very nice. For a long time. This is, it's often, um, the triode tube uh, was often called a, vacuum tube was often called a precursor to the transistor. It was not. The transistor is not a replacement for vacuum tubes in any form. Um, they're much low, uh, lower power consumption, uh, much less wasteful, generate a lot less heat, but... With vacuum tubes, you were essentially making a moving stream of electrons dance as you wanted it to, to produce the desired effect. Um, what you're seeing now is a diagram of what's called a triode, uh, called because called that because there are a grand total of three electrodes involved. Uh, cathode, obviously is in this case is heated it which makes it just happy as hell to emit electrons um a plate has an extreme positive charge which kind of accelerates them in that direction and you have a control grid in between where you can put in any signal you want and have it uh, amplified um now triode to transistor yeah they produce pretty much the uh the same the same uh results you look for a, a a linear area where an input signal would produce uh, an increase in input signal would uh, produce an increase a corresponding increase a linear corresponding increase in output current and in that respect okay transistor triode eh, same sort of thing do the same sort of thing uh, however there were tetrodes uh, pentodes there were um, uh, vacuum tubes with a, a vast number of control grids and surfaces uh, on the inside to where, um, again, it's, it's irrelevant now because uh, <laughs> the uh, the average television, for example, may be a uh, surprisingly small number of discrete components because one of them is, is some sort of uh, monolithic semiconductor block. Um, but prior to that, a, uh, a transistorized television require a ridiculously high number of discrete components, um, whereas its predecessor would have 12 vacuum tubes, and that's it. Um, and, 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 of course, a picture <laughs> tube. So these were the particle accelerators for the masses. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, and you don't even have to be Iron Man to have one. No, no, you do not. And on, honestly, they are a lot of fun to experiment with. Um, Vacuum tubes in general are... I mean, they're so much fun to just tinker with. Absolutely. And the difference between that kind of experimentation and the uh, you know transistor or integrated circuit uh, experimenting I do... You get a little bit more joy out of the uh, the vacuum tube experiments because when you turn it on, it makes a nice warm orange glow to indicate Indeed. all is good. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to, as you were doing accelerators, I just wanted to bring up the accelerator of the masses. That uh, 
No, I'm glad you did. That's that's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, that's it for me for uh, my uh, hijacking your show. Sorry. <laughs> no, you weren't hijacking my show. It's it's a collaborative thing. <laughs> Indeed. So, for anyone interested in more more information on accelerators, there's obviously a plethora of information on the internet. It's not hard to look up. Like I say, normally I do the show from my PC and I'm able to share a lot more sitting outside on a laptop right now. So, just not, not able to provide as much as I normally can, but... Check out CERN's website. Check out acceleratorsforsociety.org. There's, there, there's just, there's such a wealth of information there. You don't have to be a physicist to learn about particle accelerators and all of the amazing things that physicists have been able to accomplish with this technology, how it's helped shape the world that we live in today. It's, it's just fun stuff to learn. Agreed. And uh, uh, I should mention your, your, your show this week has inspired me to uh, re-attempt um, uh, one of what I, I had done for a science fair project. It, it got some frowns from some of the uh, instructors in the way back. But um, this has uh, it inspired me to, to uh, pick up that, that project again, see if I can build it again and get it to work, it, which was... Uh, Build your own X-ray machine. Uh, <laughs> oh, that would be a fun one. <clears throat> Again, using using a single single vacuum tube. The only problem I'm going to run into is finding goddamn Kodak paper. <laughs> That's the problem I'm going to have. That is kind of a tricky one to come across at this point in time. I've you know going ugh, going through some uh, old family records and things of that nature. I found a. Uh, Oh no, Fino! Not I think it was a. a I think it was a second generation uh, uh, Polaroid, mm -hmm. and obviously you can't get you can't get that film anymore. And I, but I'm real close to trying to make my own. Mention the Polaroid because for the experiment, well, experiment. It was really a demonstration. I wasn't breaking any new ground. I just built the thing. Um, for, for the science fair, what I, what I, uh, used, I, I wasn't using photographic paper and developing it. I was, um, I was using a Polaroid, uh, what was it? The one, the one step, remember the, uh, just push the button. There you go. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, I don't remember if the target was the bottom of the thing. You'd go, I use up all nine pictures and then leave the yeah. last one, <laughs> leave the last one. And I don't remember if the target was the bottom or if it was, but in any case, that, that was, that was how, how we got the image, um, exposed the, uh, the film while it was still inside the camera, uh, then cover the lens, hit the button, out it comes, develops, poof, look, there's fish bones inside the frozen fish. So I'm going to try and recreate <laughs> that as a follow up to this, uh, <laughs> Particle Very awesome. Part particle accelerator for the masses. Once again, using a vacuum tube. Anyway. Hey, you know, it, it started with vacuum tubes, and sometimes you just have to resort to them. They're, they're amazing little pieces of technology, and I don't think people should forget where the roots of that technology began, because if you under... It, sure, you can sit down and you can learn how to program a computer you can learn whatever oracle <clears throat> yeah there's there's cool stuff that you can do but if you don't know the technology behind it it gets sometimes very difficult to appreciate the technology and sitting down and doing experiments with vacuum tubes and you know like you've done building a tesla coil and a van de graaff generator and i'm kind of following in your footsteps on that one with the tesla coil building a you know, making your own transformers, it really makes you appreciate the technology so much more. Oh, 
Agreed. And it helps you learn it. it like, n not just, hey, I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going to learn how to understand what this is. And moving from a vacuum tube to a transistor and then microtransistors, it's real easy to sit down and open up a computer, look at a processor and go, well, yeah, that, that silicone chip does this, that, and the other. But when you learn how those actual transistor gates function, why it is that it needs to be quite literally grown in a specific setting, it, it it's fun to understand as opposed to no. Oh, speaking of old technology, Tao brings up, uh, and I'm not referring to this as old technology, Tao br brings up uh, uh, old vinyl records making a comeback. Funny that we're talking about high voltage devices and things of that sort, because <laughs> you, you know where Andy knows where I'm going with this. Old vinyl <laughs> records are excellent insulators, and if you put them real close to each other and spin them in opposite directions with aluminum foil contacts on the outside, <laughs> you've got a Wibsharth machine, and... You can generate a hell of a lot of voltage. <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up, Tao. Anyway. Way to go, Tao. Dude, good job. <laughs> Look at that. He's, he's feeding. He did that intentionally. He's, he, he was feeding us uh, feeding us triggers so that we, we, could, we could say something else interesting. Thanks, Tao. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Do you remember the, the red almost? It was almost like a clay record. I still have the original uh, Nutcracker, actually, straight out of Russia on a red hard vinyl. Uh, it, oh, it plays so much better than the synthetics. Uh, you should have been. In, uh, yeah, prior to vinyls and things of that sort, the, um, the, 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 the records, uh, what were they? Uh, 78s, whatever the hell speed they were that you would get for yeah, the, uh, for the for the Victrolas. My grandmother had a Victrola, not the little one that sits on the table. She had a big cabinet model that was, you know, like a centerpiece for a room back in the day. Oh and, yeah, um, oh yeah, they were. I, I swear they were made out of Bakelite, um, or, or or something of that sort. And I, with that heavy needle, which was it, it was not a cut crystal or anything like that. It was basically a steel pin resting on the record. and Oh, yeah, you could probably sew with the darn things. They were so I, thick. And I, I'm actually surprised that it didn't grind through this, this material. I, I strongly suspect it was, it was a Bakelite or something of that sort, which was the immediate precursor to the plastics that came after. Um, so great uh, insulators, by the way. Um, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, they were they were heavy as hell, and if you happen to drop one and it cracked in half, interestingly enough, those, those you, you could glue back together and they would play. <laughs> anyway, all right, but I digress. Back to you, Chief. Uh, the original skipping audio. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Uh, well, I think that's about all I have for accelerators today, and... For Sunday Science in general today, I look forward to a fantastic 2018 with all of our awesome viewers. I'm really glad that you take the time to join us for Sunday Science. It's a lot of fun. Uh, maybe we'll have a flashback episode to cover what we've touched on earlier. I probably should have done that on New Year's Eve, but I, like I say, had to take a holiday and get away so so you left it to us and it became a drinking thing again <laughs> smart <laughs> not the smartest of choices <laughs> hey alcohol is technology it, there's it, a very it, good it, chance that there wouldn't be civilization if it wasn't for you know we need more wheat <laughs> <laughs> yeah without the what do you mean without the alcohol we would have killed each other by now all of us <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I mean, you never know. I mean, it, obviously, we, you know, archaeologists and paleontologists can make all of the best guesses they can as to how it is that we started farming and doing this, that, and the other. 
personally, I honestly think that agriculture started from, wow, this rainwater turned into something funky tasting and it's fun. Let's start farming. I suspect. It, yeah. it, it, it's kind of a logical path. I mean, it, I, it's hard to imagine people sitting down and starting farming and starting agriculture if there wasn't any, if there wasn't a secondary benefit. But maybe that's a Sunday science episode all on its own. So the science of alcohol. Oh my! Oh, this is an idea. <laughs> this is an idea indeed, young fella. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I do make my own wine, so it could be a very fun one. Maybe uh, we should think about that one. <laughs> yeah, the uh, and not a bad idea at all. All right. Well. I got, I got enough. I, I, I hogged enough time with my uh, promoting of uh, old technology for its amusement value and a historical reference. <laughs> so, you got anything else? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't have much more, and the sun is finally dipping below the foothills here in Denver, so it's starting to actually get cold finally. Might be time to move inside. <laughs> nice. Maybe, maybe we'll get a little warm weather over here. Oh. Uh, maybe. <laughs> all right well thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of sunday science i hope you all enjoyed and as always hope it gave you something you can take away and go and learn something new that you didn't know before because education is fun agreed all right bye all thanks for joining us